Okay, I'd like to resume, please. We have uh, still two more reports to go. Uh, the Advisory Council has uh, four working groups, one of which is uh, for genomic medicine. And uh, one of the requirements of uh, a working group of the Council is to prepare, present an annual report to the full Council. Uh, the genomic medicine working group, I think uh, Carol Bolt and Dan Roden are the two Council members that serve on that. Uh, oh, is, we have a third? And now uh, Pat DeVerka. Oh, now Pat. Welcome aboard, Pat. Okay. So we have three of you. Um, so Terry is going to give the uh, annual report for the working group. Great. Thank you, Rudy. And, and thank you to uh, uh, current GMWG members as well as uh, several past members. Rex Chisholm is, uh, is a, a member who was a past uh, council member, um, which you didn't realize, Pat, when we put you on. This is that there's no escape. You never get off. So uh, we, we do appreciate it. Um, here's the, the list of members uh, shown here, uh, and then uh, uh, four folks from NHGRI who are involved. Uh, just to remind those of you who may be new to our, you can't hear me. Oh, dear. All right, I'll hold it. Uh, can you hear me now? Great. Okay. I'm Terry Minolt. No. Okay. Um, just to, to remind those of you who may be new to how we kind of conceptualize genomic medicine, um, keep in mind that there's a very large portfolio that NHGRI has focusing on sort of discovery, research, biology of disease, uh, genotype, phenotype associations and that. And then we take that information, try to relate it to medical uh, and health outcomes and treatments. Uh, and then figure out how to, how to implement that. It's these latter two components that we consider to be genomic medicine. This is somewhat of a narrow definition, but uh, we're a small institute, and so, so this is the area that uh, our group is focusing on. Our charge is to assist in advising the Institute and the Council on research needed to evaluate and implement genomic medicine, uh, including rever reviewing current progress, identifying research gaps and ways that we can fill them, uh, identify and, and publicize uh, key advances. This is a question that we're often asked, well, what has genomic medicine done for us lately? Uh, and takes up a fair amount of our time, actually. Uh, we have a series of genomic medicine meetings that I'll tell you about, and this group plans them and co-chairs them, actually. Um, on timely themes to facilitate collaborations and coordination uh, and then explore models for uh, infrastructure and sustainability of these efforts. Um, the notable accomplishments is something that we do on, on monthly uh, conference calls and in between we ask uh, members to sort of uh, send us uh, papers or announcements that they feel are worthy of, of being cited uh, in this way. This is our um, divisions uh, uh, web page and on it is a, a, a site that shows genomic medicine activities. Uh, if you go to uh, notable accomplishments in genomic medicine is sort of the first bullet below that. Uh, and if you click on that, you'll then get um, a series of papers, uh, links to papers that are broken down into these six areas um, and then a variety of, of papers that we basically try to identify things that we feel are ready for implementation or could change um, uh, practice or should be used to change uh, clinical practice. So, so many things that are foundational are not shown here but, uh, but will be uh, once their, their value in clinical care becomes known. Just a couple of examples um, from pharmacogenomics. This is actually from Singapore, uh, their health uh, agency tailoring recommendations to reduce severe cutaneous uh, adverse drug reactions. Uh, the New England Journal uh, just recently, uh, Genetic and Pharmacologic Inactivation of ANGPTL3 in Cardiovascular Disease. Um, papers like that are, we, we put into this uh, uh, list and you're welcome to, to take a look at it. Um, the group also plans a series of meetings that we use uh, to try to, to identify research areas and, uh, and other gaps and priorities that we might like to address. Our first one was held shortly after the group was formed, um, actually shortly after our strategic plan was, was published, when we got together as many groups as we knew of that were doing uh, implementation of genomics in clinical care. Uh, we then um, uh, actually published a, a paper from that that kind of gave a, a roadmap for how one might go about doing this kind of work. Uh, our second meeting was to build collaborations. We had a third with stakeholders, a fourth on physician education, and you can see each of them sort of had um, a topic or an area that it focused on. Uh, the most recent one was just uh, this past early May, Research Directions and Clinical Implementation of Pharmacogenomics, and we're currently planning a, uh, an 11th one for next April. Uh, these meetings are also uh, uh, prom uh, figuring prominently on our website. You can see just below the no notable accomplishments, there's a site that uh, shows them all. Uh, and with the, the dates, if you click on, on this one, it brings up the web page of the meeting, um, and you can get... Uh, 
the meeting summary and executive summary. If you don't have the patience to read the meeting summary, uh, tweets. Um, this is actually uh, from this particular one, uh, a resource that uh, we heard about during the meeting uh, that was presented, and we it didn't have a home, and so we offered to, to host it until they could give it a home. Um, and then, uh, much as we do for the council meetings, are all of the presentations, the topics uh, are available, um, and and uh, they're video cast and, and web archived. Uh, the group has published, as I mentioned, a, a paper from its first. Uh, meeting that uh, kind of gave a road, road map for genomic medicine implementation. Uh, the, um, the second meeting, actually it was the, an in-between meeting that, uh, that we held growing out of the first uh, that um, uh, described the need for a resource that eventually became ClinGen, as you can see here. Uh, our fourth meeting focused on education of, um, of practitioners, and uh, we, we ended up with a, a commentary in genetics and medicine on the role of professional societies in, in education and genomics. Uh, global implementation came out of our sixth meeting. Um, the ninth meeting that Carol uh, kindly uh, chaired with me um, uh, on bedside back to bench uh, was published in Cell just recently. So, uh, and we have our, our tenth meeting. There's a paper in preparation uh, from that. So, so it keeps us busy, but it also um, we think is, is a productive effort. And then just kind of showing things that have grown out of our genomic medicine meetings. Um, the the Clin Action Group, as I mentioned, came out of the first meeting that eventually evolved into ClinGen, and now has a partner in the FDA uh, called Precision FDA uh, that we are, are working with and, and sharing information with. Um, we also added uh, pharmacogenomics. You heard a little bit about uh, earlier today from Rex uh, into the Emerge project. Uh, our second meeting, about six months later, um, was focusing on um, uh, collaborative programs, and from that almost directly grew the, uh, the IGNITE program, the first phase of it. Uh, our third meeting um, was focusing on payers. We had a subsequent meeting with, with payers that uh, was a little bit challenging to get everybody on the, on the sort of same page in terms of uh, what we might be able to do together. Uh, but from that, we've been able to uh, develop a, a collaboration now with Optum and United Healthcare, who actually we, we reached out to try to get them more engaged in some of our work at the recommendation of, uh, of uh, some of the planners of the pharmacogenomics meeting. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about those efforts in a moment. Uh, the fourth meeting, as I mentioned, uh, on education uh, produced the Inter-Society Coordinating Committee for Practitioner Education in Genomics, or ISCC as we call it, uh, and you heard a little bit about that uh, this morning. Uh, the fifth meeting, uh, fifth meeting was a federal strategies meeting, uh, again, trying to bring together the various agencies, particularly of, of um, um, the Department of Health and Human Services, but also uh, we engaged the Department of Defense, many of the medical leaders in, in DOD uh, who are, you know, have a, a growing interest in this area, as you heard earlier from Wendy. Uh, our sixth meeting was of global uh, efforts at implementation. From that grew a, a genomic medicine collaborative that, that was um, sort of incubated by the National Academy of Medicine. We held this meeting uh, in conjunction with. Uh, from that, we went on to have a meeting on, whoops, uh-oh, something bad happened, okay. Um, uh, a meeting on Stevens-Johnson syndrome, toxic epidermal necrolysis, and particularly efforts uh, in other parts of the globe in Southeast Asia to um, um, implement genetic screening and uh, prevention of that condition. Uh, and from that, we uh, uh, then produced a um, program announcement uh, in serious adverse drug reactions. We've also recently um, asked the, the Global Genomic Medicine Collaborative to lead a summit of international cohorts uh, based on a, a request from the heads of international research organizations, or HEROES, as, as Eric mentioned uh, earlier this morning. Uh, our seventh meeting was on clinical decision support, led to a collaboration with the Digitized Consortium, also part of um, our collaborative, uh, also part of the National Academy of Medicine's efforts. Um, our eighth meeting was actually an overview of sort of all of our programs. We wanted to step back and kind of see where we are and, and where we're going. We heard at that meeting and, and learned about efforts building on the Genomics England program, which is an implementation uh, program that is, was uh, established by David Cameron when he was prime minister and has grown uh, into a 100,000 uh, uh, genome uh, project. This is the health education effort, which we were encouraged to try to um, uh, collaborate with and, and develop um, uh, joint educational programs with, which we are working on uh, with the ISCC, my apologies. Um, and also uh, the, the NHS England, which is the parent body for health education England, uh, now has a uh, uh, chief medical officer report on uh, genomic medicine implementation that we are going to try to leverage off, and I'll tell you a little bit about that in a moment. Um, and then our ninth meeting, I mentioned in the tenth meeting, um, I'll go over a little bit more uh, what has happened from them. So with, from the ninth meeting, uh, the bedside back to bench 
meeting the idea was to particularly focus on variants of unknown significance and clinically relevant genes and figure out ways that uh, we might be able to determine how important those might be clinically. So um, uh, one of the key recommendations was at least let basic scientists know what the clinically relevant genes are um, so that they could be prioritized for functional studies. And there were a, a variety of ways of doing that, but uh, we recommended some in the cell paper and at the meeting. And then encourage development of high throughput assays and animal models from these genes. And I was delighted, uh, Jay, to see this paper that you're a, a key member of uh, that was actually uh, uh, just in last week's or this week's American Journal of uh, Human Genetics. Lee Starita and Doug Fowler were both participants in our, our workshop and were key contributors in that. Um, and basically, uh, uh, they proposed approaches to doing high throughput screening for um, um, uh, testing variants of unknown function. Um, they propose in this paper multiplex variants, uh, assays of variant effect, or MAVE, and describe a couple of technologies for doing that. And then said that a goal for um, genomics should be to develop a data-driven prediction for every variant uh, in every clinically relevant gene, which is, um, they're not thinking small, which is, which is good, um, but also something that we would see as being uh, quite important if it can be done at scale. Uh, in addition to those, um, um, we were advised to develop larger reference variant databases linking to phenotypes, much like the um, uh, NOMAD and the one that preceded it, which I can't think of the name, but you know what I mean, the exome one. Um, so, uh, and uh, develop, yeah, you all know, develop and adopt standards for phenotype description and data sharing and promote cross-disciplinary understanding and opportunities for, for interaction. This is one of the toughest ones because people already go to a whole host of meetings uh, and trying to get them to come to more is even more difficult. We do try to, to include basic science, scientists in our uh, clinically relevant meetings, in our pharmacogenomics meeting, uh, for example, and in other uh, similar meetings. So hopefully that, uh, that effort can continue. For our 10th meeting, um, our, uh, as I showed you the, um, uh, the website of it here, the goals were to survey uh, national and international landscapes of research programs in implementation of pharmacogenomics, sort of where are we, how did we get here, uh, review current advances in clinical, implement, uh, clinical applications, and then discuss limitations and obstacles uh, to that clinical implementation, identify evidence gaps and studies to address them, and then discuss, discuss potential strategies for large-scale evaluation and implementation of pharmacogenomics in clinical care in the U.S. Uh, we recognize that there are studies of, of this on a large scale going on in Europe, um, and uh, we're hoping that uh, something similar might be possible within the U.S., at least in a way uh, that would not conflict with what comes out of, of other studies, as has happened to us, unfortunately, in the past. Um, other prominent recommendations included identifying minimum quality standards for pharmacogenetic testing because the standards currently vary quite a bit. One doesn't know when a given gene is testing. Are they testing only a single SNP? Are they testing multiple SNPs? Are they sequencing it? If they do, to what depth, et cetera. Uh, so coming up with standards for that, and there was interest in the, uh, among the professional societies in doing that. Developing improved, uh, an improved coding system for genetic testing that could conceivably augment or even replace the uh, CPT's current something. Procedural terminology, thank you, uh, uh, codes, uh, of which there are only 200 to cover all of the genome, which clearly is not a, a workable system. Uh, we had strong encouragement from the payer side uh, to try to do this, uh, since it's, it's almost impossible for them to know with 200 codes what it, even what they're paying for, uh, let alone whether it works and, and whether they should be uh, reimbursing that. Uh, and the suggestion came up maybe basing that on, on NCBI's genetic testing registry, and we're looking into the possibility of doing that. Um, and then possibly encouraging development of plug-in modules for electronic medical records uh, for drug gene interactions, much like the drug-drug interaction software that's currently available, um, hopefully a little bit better than that, because sometimes it can be a little bit cumbersome. Uh, but if, if we can promote that kind of development, um, and particularly building it on solidly founded guidelines, uh, that was felt to be a, a high priority as well. Um, so, and then a, a number of others uh, trying to reuse data from genotype data in prior trials, creating registries. Um, one that, that we do struggle with a bit is that, you know, when we bring groups together, we're in a bit of an echo chamber. We have sort of all of the positive folks, but sometimes not the negative folks. And so we, we really, when we discuss the potential for evidence generation through a randomized clinical trial, the, this was the group of folks who said it's not ethical to randomize people because we know this makes a difference. Obviously, um, when you do a clinical trial, you need an equal number of, group, of, of folks saying it's, it's not ethical to randomize people because we know it doesn't make any difference. And so, so that's 
that's the, the area the, the, with the point of what's called clinical equipoise. We need to get some of those skeptics in the room. And so that was a, a suggestion to try to uh, examine how we, we could do this kind of study uh, and potentially consider uh, approaches such as a staggered rollout, where even if you're a believer, you can't possibly roll this out into every clinic and every site all at once. And so if there were some timed or phased rollout, particularly if that was done in a, in a somewhat random way, um, uh, one could then compare early rollout folks to the later rollouts as, as controls. So, so things that we're talking about and uh, uh, hoping to try to pursue. Uh, and then we have a few irons in the fire. Um, collaborating with payers, as I mentioned, Optum and United Healthcare have uh, made two visits to us uh, so far, and, and uh, I've been to at least one of their seminars and another coming up. Um, we would like to develop a collaborative evidence generation project. They have a huge, huge database. Um, they don't have great, the greatest genetic testing information, as I described, but uh, they do have the opportunities to, to try to make that better. Uh, and potentially working with them to develop a revised genetic testing coding system, uh, promoting genomic medicine through common policy and public engagement opportunities that they have not only within their system and their physicians, but also with other payers. And they are particularly interested in having something that would engage other payers, as are we, because we don't want to just be working with one group. Um, accessing their, their data for the uh, outcomes of genetic testing and getting their advice and the advice of others um, with similar stakeholders on, on compelling outcomes and other aspects of design of implementation studies. So when we do an implementation study, if we came up with this finding uh, measured in this way, would that be convincing to you? And if not, what is it that would be convincing to you? Uh, so trying to pin them down a little bit on that. Uh, several members of the group have also um, uh, worked with the National Quality Forum and uh, groups like that to try to define uh, quality measures that could be implemented into clinical care. Uh, as you, you may be aware, there are a variety of metrics that hospitals and clinicians are measured on. You know, do you vaccinate patients for pneumonia? Do you um, uh, prevent bed sores? You know, a, a number of things. Uh, and, and could we get some of those kinds of measures into uh, national quality standards? This is a long and painful and very expensive process uh, to do. It involves evidence uh, reviews and evidence generation as well as agreeing on standards and ways to collect them. But it's a, a discussion that we've started. Uh, Rex Chisholm and Mark Williams in particular, and now Pat is, is uh, getting enmeshed in, in these discussions as well, um, trying to present to them some, some areas that we feel really are ready and should be implemented um, uh, clinically and used as quality measures, such as tumor-based screening for colorectal cancer patients for Lynch syndrome, followed by cascade screening in relatives to the degree that a healthcare system can do that, uh, BRCA1 or 2 testing in all ovarian cancer patients. This was something that was proposed. Uh, and in, in breast cancer patients meeting certain criteria, again, followed by cascade screening, possibly genetic testing in patients with sustained elevated cholesterol levels with cascade screening pharmacogenetic testing. They're, these were the ones that, were, that seemed to, to our group to be sort of at the, you know, with the highest level of evidence and the easiest, quote unquote, uh, to implement. Um, and um, in working with the NQF, they are considering them, but their consideration process takes a while, and so we'll continue to, to push with them on this. And then the possibility of an evidence generation project building on a system that's already going to be implementing anyway, so why not take, try to take advantage of that? Uh, this is the Generation Genome Report from the Chief Medical Officer of NHS England, Dame Sally Davis. Davies, came out uh, a month or two ago, and Jeff Ginsburg uh, highlighted it for us and said, gee, you know, they're already implementing a, a huge number of things. Can we not build on that to learn a little bit more about what works and what doesn't? Recognizing there are major differences between the healthcare systems, but there are also some similarities uh, that we could we could work with. So they are planning to roll out genomic medicine services based on what they learned from Genomics England uh, in early 2019. Could we put an evidence generating uh, research project on top of that? Um, looking at not only clinical impact, but public uh, engagement in education, the impact of provider education, which they are doing um, far more effectively, I think, than, than anything that we've seen here in the U.S and feedback from providers, and then policy and regulatory strategies. So hopefully uh, these conversations are ongoing, and, and you'll hear more about that uh, soon. And with that, I'd like to thank um, uh, everyone at NHGRI who's very heavily involved in all the things that make the Genomic Medicine Working Group work, uh, particularly, of course, the uh, uh, Genomic Medicine Working Group members, and then uh, the members of the genomic, our genomic medicine programs and their investigators. So thank you. I'll be happy to take any questions.
Questions for Terry? Crystal clear? Yeah, I think didn't get enough caffeine. We're good? Okay. All right. Thanks, Terry.